John chapter 18 gives us a synopsis of the trial of Jesus. Jesus had six trials, three religious trials, and three civil trials. And this took place a long time ago. But Jesus Christ is still on trial. You notice in this chapter, just this chapter, he was arrested in the garden by a band of soldiers sent from the high priest, not from Pilate, not from the Roman authorities. These band of soldiers were sent by the high priest and the Pharisees. So therefore, it was an, uh, a religious arrest. They come up there. Jesus saw them coming. He had his disciples with him. Eleven disciples on this side. One former disciple with the band of soldiers. Whom seek ye? Jesus made it plain. He said, I am. Now in the King James, it added the word he. But he declared himself to be the great I am. You're looking at him. Why? Are you coming to me? Well, we come from the chief priests and the Pharisees because we need to question you back at the house of authority. But when Jesus said that, they fell backward. But you notice they got up. And Jesus asked them again, Whom sink ye? They said, We seek Jesus of Nazareth. And he answered the second time, I am. You're looking at the great I am in shoe leather, in humanity standing there in his human weakness, subject to the authorities of men. But yet at his potential, at the very words that he could speak, he could call 72,000 angels. And he didn't do it because he said, I am come to drink the cup that my father gave me. As we know the story, as the chapter so laid out, he was tried in a religious court. He was first taken to Annas. Then he was taken to Caiaphas, who was the son-in-law of Annas. Annas was a, we get the picture that he was an older man at this time. And he had five sons that had served as high priest. And now Caiaphas was his son-in-law serving, serving at, as high priest. You think maybe there was a little political appointment going on there? Well, first of all, these men were not in the genealogical line of Aaron, and they were not qualified to serve as high priest. It was a bogus court. It was a kangaroo court, first of all. But Jesus was tried by Annas. Then he sent him over 
to Caiaphas. And Caiaphas, no doubt under the influence of his father-in-law, and Annas knew that he would render the same judgment that he just rendered, guilty. I read an article not too long ago that made a lot of sense. The author took the name Caiaphas and he analyzed it linguistically to find out what was the origin or the nationality of this name. And the writer, I thought, did an excellent job, and he traced it back to an Edomite origin. Significant. So these men were not of the line of Aaron. These men had their mind made up before Jesus stepped in to the judgment hall. Because Caiaphas had already rendered a guilty verdict. In John chapter 11, we see where Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. That made him angry. And in verse 47, John 11, this is immediately after the miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead. In verse 46, but some of them went their way to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. The Pharisees had their lackeys working for them. And so therefore they went and they said, hey, do you know what Jesus, this man Jesus just did? He raised a man from the dead. Verse 47. Then gathered the chief priest and the Pharisees a council. And the question on the table was, what do we? What are we going to do about this man, Jesus Christ? You see, Jesus was on trial before he was arrested. Jesus Christ is still on trial. Jesus Christ is a national question. He's a political question. He's a religious question. He's a personal question. He's a social question. What we see going on in our country and around the world, especially in the Western world, is what are we going to do with this man called Jesus? They may not mention his name, but they know that he has written some law that says, Thou shalt not, and we are not going to obey this law. So therefore, our Supreme Court, for example, or our Congress, or, says, What are we going to do with this? They know that law came from God. What are we going to do with this? So we have another council, a modern council of chief priests and Pharisees saying, what do we do? For this man doeth many miracles. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. In other words, we have a grip on political power. You just you interpret this however you want to. We, the Pharisees, modern Pharisees, chief priests, whatever, have a grip on political power. And if we allow Jesus Christ, Christianity, and the law of God to take over, we're going to lose our place. We're going to lose our power. The question is, 
Jesus Christ. What are we going to do with him? Now this same high priest is Caiaphas. So this is seven chapters previous to his arrest. Verse 49, chapter 11. And one of them named Caiaphas, same man, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all. Nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not. And this spake he, and this spake he not of himself. But being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. Seven chapters of the book of John before Jesus' arrest. Caiaphas had already made up his mind. So that when Jesus, after being arrested by the soldiers, came into Caiaphas' judgment hall, the verdict was already read. You see that? He prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. Not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together and one the children of God that were scattered abroad, all the other Israelites. So did Jesus have a fair trial? The trial took place at night, approximately 9 p.m. is when he was arrested. He was crucified the next morning at 9 a.m. And this was a 12-hour drama that went from a 9 p.m. from one court to the next court to Pilate's court, then back to the religious court and with six trials. Jesus was tried. I want to apply it this way quickly. Religious court and civil court. Jesus Christ, whenever our legislature, our executive branch, or our judicial branch gives opinion on a moral question as mentioned in Scripture. They're putting Jesus Christ again on trial. When the court says it's lawful, for example, same-sex marriage, the Bible had already rendered its verdict from the mouth of the lawgiver. But now they're saying, no, we are going to supersede this law. They put God on trial. They put Jesus Christ on trial. Unfortunately, it just made me really nauseated when the former occupant of the White House allowed for the rainbow colors to cover that White House. See, he was giving consent to something that God had already forbidden. Now, he put Jesus Christ on trial, and Jesus Christ lost. But that's not the last trial. <laughs> Our God's going to put man on trial. <laughs> and it will be the judgment day of all judgment days. We used to sing a song years ago, there's a great day coming. There's a great day coming by and by. For the saint and the sinner shall be gathered from east to west. 
there's a great day coming. But see, that man in his presumptuous arrogance can say, Jesus, we're going to put you to death. Caiaphas rendered a guilty verdict. The civil authority invested in Pilate, he didn't know what to do. I find no fault. Now, how do, you, how do we apply that today? Because the civil authorities have condemned him. The civil authority in Pilate consented to the religious verdict. You follow me? The civil authority consented to the verdict that was given by the religious authorities. That leads me to say this, as the church goes, so goes the world. As the church goes, so goes the government. As the church goes, so goes the culture. It comes back to the church. Now, standing there in front of these men, being on trial before the religious authorities, stood two of his disciples. Peter and John. And the record tells us that Peter stood outside the door. John went on in because he was, a, he was known to the high priest. Went on inside. So Peter's standing out there. Peter's on trial. By a little maiden. said, weren't you, uh, weren't you one of the, uh, his disciples? I am not. See, Jesus was on trial. Peter was on trial. And it came down to personal commitment. And Jesus was being condemned by the religious authorities. Now he was being forsaken by the chief apostle. I don't know him. Well, Malchus, who had just had his right ear cut off, and Jesus healed his ear, he was in the garden. He said, I recognize you. <laughs> Weren't you out there in the, in the garden? And maybe even, he might have even said, I'm the man that you cut off his ear. Peter said, oh no, not me. Not, not me. Then the maiden again. John brings, him, brings Peter inside the house. Once again, the third time, I don't know the man. Wow. You know, that may come down to us someday. You follow me? When Jesus is really put on trial in the court of injustice in our nation, and they ask you, and they ask me, weren't you one of his followers? Oh, no, 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 not me. The Peter syndrome. Not me. The second question, weren't you one? Weren't you with him? No, no. The third time, oh, no.
But there was an election in Peter, you see. He wasn't going to get by with it. This showed Peter's utter weakness. But Jesus said, Peter, when you are converted, <laughs> you strengthen the disciples. However you interpret that, was that conversion in Acts chapter 2? Whenever, maybe it began immediately when Peter went out and he wept bitterly. Bitterly. Because apparently Jesus, see, Peter's inside the house at this point with John. And Jesus turned. In the other account, it says Jesus turned and looked at Peter. Not John, but he looked at Peter. And that look, I'm sure, was the gazing eyes of inspection into the very heart of Peter. And I'm sure that Peter, using my imagination, no doubt, however long Peter lived, we'll say 80 years old, he could probably close his eyes and still see that look of Jesus. See the piercing eyes of the I am look right through him into his very soul. And he went out and he wept bitterly. Well, Jesus is still on trial. When he was born, Herod tried to kill him. When he was introduced by John, John records, he made the world, but the world knew him not. They knew him not. The record goes on to tell us in Matthew chapter 4 that he was in the garden or in the wilderness. And the Pharisees came to him. The Bible says Satan came to him, but I believe it was the Pharisees. I think it was actual men that came to him. The devil knew who he was. But these Pharisees they questioned his deity. The deity of Jesus Christ, the authority of this scripture right here, of this book that we read, is under question by religious authorities. I'm sure some of you catch these articles that come over the internet and there's some folks in Canada that send me quite a few newspaper clippings. And apparently, the state, I'm going to call it the state church of Canada, is spiritually bankrupt. They questioned the deity of Jesus Christ. They questioned the authenticity of Scripture. But yet, their religious system is organized, it's rich, it's systematized. It's everything that you want. But it's a graveyard, a religious graveyard. Jesus said, whited sepulchers. Lady sent us, or lady called up on the phone last week and told Mary Lee this. She attended St. George's Episcopal Church in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Christmas Eve program. And the priest, 
she said, was an older man. And, you know, those churches are built with the uh, sacred desk elevated several steps. And he tripped going up the steps. And this lady was sitting near the front, and she gasped, and uh, she said a deacon gasped, you know, the old gentleman's going to hurt himself. But anyway, he got up to the, to the pulpit, and he said that the Bible and the Quran are equal. This is in an Episcopal church in America. They're equal. And she questioned the deacon and called. He, he, he went on to say that the mother of Jesus, Mary, in the Quran is called Miriam. So therefore, he's going to call her Miriam by her, what he says, her proper name. So... At the end of the service, this lady is just, just flabbergasted. So she mentioned about this horror to a deacon as she's going out the door, and the deacon said, well, you've got to love your enemies. And you, you've got to love Jesus, too. You don't love Jesus, lady. You don't love Jesus, and you've got to love your enemies. Acquiescing capitulation, giving over, equated the Bible with the Quran. There should have been an uproar. But the people are financing this. And that is not the only example. Many churches has put Jesus on trial. He's on trial in the religious courthouse. And we already mentioned he's on trial in the state house. And even Peter. On trial, Peter failed. But he repented. But in another case, in John, I think it's John chapter 6, Jesus is speaking and he's saying some hard words and he says something like, Unless ye eat my flesh and drink my blood, ye have no life in you. I am the good shepherd, he says. I am the good shepherd. And, in, and then it tells us, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. They probably figured up to that point, man, we have a, a, a wonderful leader. He's going to overthrow the Roman government. Everything is going our way until Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. No man can come unto me except it were given of him of my father. And unless ye eat my flesh and drink my blood, this man is crazy, they said. He's crazy. Jesus was on trial from his very birth. Mentioned when he was in the wilderness. Satan, in the form of these Pharisees, came to him and said, If thou be the Son of God. If thou be. Three times. If thou be the Son of God, do so and so. When he was on the cross, 
the same gang that was at the wilderness temptation says, if thou be the Son of God, come down. You see, Jesus' deity, His divinity is always in question by the religious crowd. Now, there's many statistics, and I don't want to, I didn't bring them with me, and they're kind of boring. But you know already that many churches, many uh, councils, statements of faith have been changed to accommodate a more liberal gospel. And some of the most well-financed preachers on TV have said there's more than one way to God. When Jesus settled that question, I am the way. So he's on trial again. He's always on trial. Well, in John chapter 2, what do we read? Jesus turned the water into wine. Then he goes into the temple. At Passover time, John 2.13, and he found in the temple a desecration going on. Mercenaries had taken over the place. Money changers had taken preeminence. And Jesus, being the meek and the kind, little man that he was. He made a scourge. It doesn't say he picked up an already made scourge. You notice that? He, this is the way I picture. He sat down somewhere and he gathered the ingredients and he, looking at these money changers, and he made this scourge just like he wanted it. And when he got it finished, he says to himself, time to start. He might have taken an hour to make that thing. And inside, he was probably boiling. <laughs> Do you ever boil? He ran them out. Verse 18, then answered the Jews and said, what sign are you going to give, give to us seeing that you do these things? You messed up our apple cart. You messed up our religious finance. You overthrew the tables. The little animals are gone and the doves are gone you messed up our religious playhouse. By what authority? They're questioning him again. And then he gave them something to think about. He said, you destroy this temple. He had already cleaned up that physical temple. He said, you destroy this temple in three days. I'll raise it up. Well, that threw them for a loop. They didn't know what they, and the disciples didn't know until later. As we go through this Bible, there's many examples. Five sixteen. moving on quickly. The Bible tells us, After he had healed a man 
at the troubled pool. It says in verse 16, Therefore the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. He couldn't do anything right. They questioned his authority. Verse 18, Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him. Because he had not only broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his Father. <laughs> he knew just where to touch. Well, there's many examples. In chapter 6, verse 52, what does it say? Jesus said, I am the bread of life. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? How can he do that? In Chapter 6, already mentioned that even some of his disciples forsook him and fled. It wasn't even safe for Jesus to go to Jerusalem. John 7, 1. It wasn't safe. Why? because his life was threatened. Chapter 8, verse 13, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. The Pharisees said, Thou bearest record of thyself. Thy record is not true. They doubted his words. Folks, the one we serve is the one that the world hates. Someday, it's very obvious to all of us, someday, someone is going to ask us, aren't you one of his disciples? What are we going to say? Oh, no, not me. Oh, you know, to save my own skin, save my own neck. Go back to John 8, verse 19. He spoke, Jesus spoke concerning his father. They, the Pharisees, questioned his birth whether it was legitimate or not. Where is your father? Where is your father? Now, there's a long discussion there following that question. But we come down to verse number 22. Then they questioned his sanity. You see that? This man's going to commit suicide. Will he kill himself? Because he said he's going to go away. They questioned his birth, the legitimacy of his birth. Now they questioned his mentality. We sit in this building in four walls with a roof over our head. We are in a sanctuary. But there is a world out there, religious, civil, moral, political world that is raging. 
And the issue is, who is Jesus Christ? It may come under a, a political bill or civil rights or whatever, or social justice. That's a good one. But it's, are we going to allow this man to rule over us? The White House has already said no. The Supreme Court has said no. And our Congress, they're deaf, deaf, blind, and dumb. They won't speak up at all. Verse 25. They said unto him, Who art thou? Who are you anyway? Verse 48. Jesus had just said, If you're of God, you hear my words. If you don't hear my words, you're not of God. Verse 48. They answered, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan? and your devil possessed. You are devil possessed. 52, then said the Jews, now we know that thou hast a devil. 53, art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead, and the prophets? Who do you think you are? See, they question his deity, his pre-existence, his birth, his mental soundness. All this is going on yet today. It's going on yet today. And it's coming from the same bunch that Jesus met and dealt with in the book of John. 57. You're not even 50 years old and you claim that you saw Abraham. In other words, folks, what they were saying is that you are a maniac. You're nuts. That's what the world is saying today. Look at them in the streets. Did you see the sign? I guess it was about a year ago. Were these, was it two lesbians holding up this big sign? It said something like, if Mary would have had an abortion. You remember that sign? We wouldn't have this problem. See, the question is not abortion. The question is, we will not have this man to rule over us. That's the question. So we may as well have stiffen our backbone. Chapter 10, I'm going to move on quickly. Verse 20. Jesus said he was the good shepherd. There was a division among the people. Many of them said, this man is devil possessed. He's mad. Why even go listen to him? Verse 24. Then came the Jews round about him and said, How long dost thou make us the doubt? If you're the Christ, tell us. He had already told them. That reminds me of something that makes me rather puzzled and, and sick at the same time. When one 
popular, well-financed, overweight preacher from Texas writes a book that says Jesus was not the Messiah. Therefore, the Jews of today are exonerated for not accepting him because he never said that he was the Messiah. I think you know who I'm talking about. Well, 33, 31 says, why don't we just take up some stones and kill him? Do away with him. Thirty-three. Jesus answered, "For a good work." The Jews answered him, saying, "For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, because thou, being a man, you make yourself God." Well, it says, chapter 11, verse 47, we referred to this earlier. They formed a council after the raising of of Lazarus, but when we come to chapter 12 and verse number 10, they're still stirring over this miracle. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death. If we could do away with his follower, if we could do away with the evidence of his deity, then the people and the council will be more apt to put Jesus to death. Folks, we're the Lazarus. Hello? We're the Lazarus. So, in plain oaky language, if they can nullify our testimony and do away with us, they can do away with the Christ. You follow me? We're the evidence. We're the ones that have been brought back from the spiritual grave and death. So, Okay, we can't put Jesus to death right now, but, you know, if we could just get rid of these crazy right-wing Bible-thumping, you know, evangelical Christians. You with me? Well, we've made full circle. You know, God is the great avenger. This is what one man wrote. Careless seems the great avenger. History's pages but record one death grapple in the darkness between old systems and the word. Truth is forever on the scaffold. And wrong is seemingly always on the throne. Yet that scaffold sways the future, and behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadows, keeping watch above his own. God is watching. This book that we have read from this morning, so much 
He's watching over His Word. And it says that His Word shall not return void. But Jesus Christ, always on trial. Back then and now. Put yourself in the place of Peter. Do you know him? Are you a follower? We just stiffen up and say yes.